Before modern From Software was the beloved studio that it is today, it took a long path of experimentation from surprising beginnings to reach its current status. With the success of its recent games, many of old From Software's catalog has now been documented by fantastic creators and for many years. Heck, a much younger version of myself even covered the Kingsfield series back in 2014 in videos that I refuse to make public due to a very real risk of dying from embarrassment. In the timeline of Souls Likes, Kingsfield started it all. But after Kingsfield 3, known as Kingsfield 2 in the West, they took a detour with the same framework, but slightly different ideas, not unlike what they have done years later during the actual Dark Souls series. Among those experiments were Shadow Tower for the PS1 in 1998 and Shadow Tower Abyss for the PS2 in 2003, and we'll be covering both of those throughout this video. Shadow Tower was released in Japan and North America, and it was critically panned. Hard. People disliked it even more than Kingsfield. Shadow Tower Abyss was released only in Japan, but plenty of people here in the West have talked about it, and there's even a fan translation. And so today, I want to tell you the story of my dives into these games and the conclusions I've reached from thinking a lot about them. But I have to set some ground rules, because I don't want to be just another long essay or retrospective on the pile. I want to offer something unique. While I will be talking about these games in the context of From Software's other titles, I want to compare as little as possible. I don't need to bring up Dark Souls every three seconds to analyze these games. I can do so on their own merits, hopefully, only bringing it up when it's really noticeable or surprising. My goal is to play through these games, understanding their context and history, of course, but I really want to evaluate them, staying focused on the present. What can we still learn from them today, if there is anything to learn from them? Spoilers, there is. Plenty. I also don't want to say these games are underrated or something just because they're old from software games. I want to truly be as objective as I can, so join me in my first retro edition of an in-depth analysis and review of the Shadow Tower series. Shadow Tower 1 starts with a very brief setup. There's a tower close to a town. That is pretty much it. Once the intro cinematic is over, the game starts. There's no tutorial, no guidance, no nothing. Heck, the first thing I did was accidentally fall off and die while testing the controls. The control scheme is not one I'm unfamiliar with, since it is very close to Kingsfield, but it's still uncomfortable. And despite what others might say, just because you get used to it in the end, doesn't mean that it's ever good. You move with the D-pad, turning with tank controls. L1 and R1 allow you to strafe, but L2 and R2 allow you to look up and down. Select will open your menu, and the face buttons correspond to interact with the X button, the left hand with the square button, the right hand on the triangle button, and circle for magic. Magic can be equipped and used on both hands by equipping rings. So you tap circle and then the button or the hand that you want to use in quick succession. Your melee strikes depend on the power bar, which is up there along with your HP number. That is not an HP bar. If the power bar is full, you'll deal full damage when striking, but you can swing before that and do less damage, but also potentially stagger an enemy. You do indeed get used to the control scheme, but it's not easy. It's very obviously of its time and far from ideal and it took me quite a number of hours to stop accidentally reaching for the right analog stick to look around. Nothing is explained to you. Items don't have names until you read them in your inventory. You're meant to recognize them by sight, and you will eventually. Mechanics aren't explained to you in the slightest, but of course, this comes from a time when you were expected to read the manual for a game, probably excitedly in the back of the family car coming home from Electronic Boutique or KB Games. And reading that manual did help me and explain things like save points and the soul points system. 
But don't think for a moment that reading through the manual is equivalent to more modern tutorials that we have today. You are still very much thrown into a deep end of secret hallways, unexplained phenomena, and obscure design. This is a very atmospheric game, and the introduction of simply walking down these steps and being confronted with your first enemies adds to that. The atmosphere on display here is oppressive, hostile, with just the right amount of mystery, but a violence that continuously tells you that you shouldn't be here. When I decided to do this video much like other videos I do, I try and go in with as open a mind as possible. But I always do have some preconceived notions. I expected the game to be old, cumbersome, frustrating, but to have a certain magic and charm to it that would be interesting, especially when contrasted with this studio's later output. But this isn't what I found. Instead, I found something hauntingly mesmerizing and wholly immersive for its time. A slow-paced, moody crawl through a world that kept me curious. Sure, it is dated and it is frustrating, but it's also kind of beautiful and horrifying, or as much as the PS1 graphics will allow, while still retaining the gameplay progression of the dungeon crawlers that inspired it, meaning that your trek through the tower always has you motivated to press on with each new weapon, armor, or spell as you get stronger. Developers said they wanted to take a more western fantasy approach to this game compared to Kingsfield, and I'm not entirely sure I see that. It just feels like a darker, more depressing version of Kingsfield, and if you know that franchise, you know how serious that statement is. But as we will see later, this initial impression subsides into some more fantasy-like moods that are also less depressing and more triumphant. There is almost no music in the game, and the sound team behind it was also working on Echo Knight, another of From Software's experiments, this one being a more direct foray into the horror adventure genre. And you can hear that influence immediately. The constant silence is broken only by the sounds that come from each room and hallway with some very distinct but also unsettling noises from enemies, both making you fear them, but also immediately know what enemy it is just from the sound it makes. The most interesting part about Shadow Tower, however, is how simple and compartmentalized it is in structure. Compared to the Kingsfield games before it, and also the Soul Saga, including Sekiro, Bloodborne, and Elden Ring after it, Shadow Tower has a structure more reminiscent of old platformers. It's divided into eight worlds, each of them corresponding to a floor of the tower, and each world is divided into areas, acting almost as self-contained levels. Each world has a larger theme, and each area is more or less connected to that theme. You start off in Human World, with the areas being a prison, a graveyard, the ruins under the graveyard, and sacrificial religious caves. While exploring this first world, I realized that enemies don't respawn, and you don't really level up. It's more precise to say that you don't choose your level ups. Every enemy you defeat directly contributes to your stats, making you stronger. And with there being a limited amount of enemies in the game, defeating each of them becomes not only something you do to advance, but something you seek out in order to become more powerful. When you start out, you're weak, confused, and afraid. But as different parts of the game start to click, you feel more and more empowered and look forward to combat. This is something important to note. Within the limitations of this gameplay style and the clunkiness inherent in it, such as gauging distance and hitboxes when swinging weapons, Shadow Tower is much more interested in dealing severe damage to you on mistakes, such as positioning or target priority. But it's never really difficult, nor does it drag on with long periods of combat where you take chip damage. It's overall quite easy but it will punish you harshly for mistakes, making it so you're always thinking about your encounters, but never really put into situations where you feel like the odds are overwhelming or it's just a numbers game. Well, 
in its majority. There are exceptions. A good example of those exceptions comes very early on into World 2, which is Earthworld. After navigating the first four areas of Human World and defeating the Guardian, the game has supplied you with armor, different weapons, and introduced its actual level up mechanic, the Soul Pods, consumable flasks that give you ability points that you can manually allocate. These can be found throughout the world in exploration, and some can be bought at the shop, more on that later. World 2 really ramps up the difficulty and complexity, and this is where I began to see the value of this game, and kind of fell in love with it. The first room you encounter contains a large group of plants shooting deadly laser beams, and you will have to strafe around the room to approach them and defeat them. But if you go too far, you might encounter this tree, which can paralyze you, all but guaranteeing your death and sending you to your last save. That is, if you have a last save, because let's be honest, if you play this game, you'll probably do it how I did, using save states with an emulator. Many of these mechanics that the game wants to teach you are things that you first have to experience and die to in order to then learn and play around them. And in this day and age, I see no reason to suffer through slow loading screens, followed by even slower movement, just to get back to the same room and try again, or to decipher what is even happening. The first time I died to the paralysis from the tree, I couldn't see the tree. I didn't know what had happened. The second time, I understood it was the tree, but what followed was trial and error in understanding the distance at which the tree would aggro to me, and seeing if it was a better idea to target it first or to avoid its range. If for each attempt at it I had to reload to my previous save, the added 10 minutes or so would have definitely hampered my experience, and I can start to see why critics at the time would have bounced off the game and fast. This same routine will repeat throughout the game, as you encounter new enemies and mechanics and understand what they do, sometimes at the cost of your consumables and sometimes at the cost of reloading, and those consumables are more valuable than you think. Let me explain. In this world is where you start running into the smithy as well as the shop. Let's talk about the shop first. You accumulate kunes or kunes throughout the game, exploring or through enemy drops, and you can spend it here to buy soul pods, HP, and mana potions, as well as a lot of different weapons and other equipment. The most valuable things in your arsenal, aside from those juicy stat points, are those potions, because they are the only way that you really have to replenish resources. And they also scale. Both health and mana are fully recovered whenever you use one, so you really want to avoid using them until those bars are almost out. This is where the smithy comes in, because your health is a resource to repair your equipment. While there are consumables to recover the durability of your equipment, the smithy is the best and most reliable way to do so as far as I could tell. And durability is very important. Your weapons and armor will break, so you really want to carry a lot of different weapons and swap between them to keep them from fully breaking, since if they do, their repair cost goes up. Later on, you can also exchange your more irrelevant weapons that become obsolete for mana or health potions, which also aids in clearing up your inventory. But keeping a varied and expansive arsenal is crucial to success. Your ranged weapons, as well as your rings that you will use for casting spells, also lose durability when used, so you have to be aware of that while playing. This truly is the breath of the wild of Dark Souls. If all of this is starting to sound like a chore or something overly, well, breath of the wild-like, which I know gives some people very intense reactions, I do think that's a personal preference. But trying to judge this as objectively as possible, I think it's well paced. The best way that I can put it is that it feels much more like a survival horror game than Dark Souls but with constantly breaking equipment. Because the total number of enemies is accounted for, and so are most of the things you can obtain, it feels like it's all very purposeful, 
much like it would be in a Resident Evil game. Just think of your durability as ammo or any other resource. This doesn't have any of that fancy dynamic difficulty like Resident Evil 4, so it really needs to be very tightly paced and controlled, and I think it overall does a fantastic job, with some specific moments standing out as not as good. The wild card here is your performance, because the cost for repairing equipment is your health. Performing well in combat, not falling into traps, and saving your total HP, both available at the moment and the total number of potions you have, will then allow you to spend that on repairing your best equipment and using it more often. I still think overall you get plenty of potions and gear along the way to choose to spend HP on repairs or to progress primarily off of the things you pick up. This really shows that this concept that is often overlooked that From Software uses, much like it does in Souls, with making the Souls the currency for both your level ups as well as for shops, is something that they have explored for a long time, as they do here with HP as your economy, and they will probably continue to experiment with this further. During World 2, you realize very quickly that enemy variety is very high. Of course, these enemies are not particularly complex or unique, given how the game plays. But precisely because of that, I think it's really important that every new area contains new enemies to play around with. It's exciting to see what twisted weird thing comes out next and what they do. Along with that, we start to see how side quests can develop in these sorts of games. In the human world, you could meet Ariel, a demoness that has been sealed away by Durin, which you will encounter in this next area in World 2. And this point is where the whole structure of the game comes together. In the Poisonous Cavern, the second area of the second floor, Durin kind of tricks you, and you have to walk through poison. You can use a poison vaccine, or just run through and then use anti-venoms, but you'll encounter these poison zombies hanging from the ceiling. They are dripping poison. At first, you can take them down normally with your melee weapons, but after that, the next ones are out of melee range. If you explore this area, you'll find a bow, which you can use to take them out. Although you could also have magic and have taken them out that way too. Once you get the bow and shoot the zombies down, after a minute or so, the poison below disappears. It's a nice, tidy, logical puzzle that also introduces ranged weapons. A little piece of Zelda in the middle of Shadow Tower. And now you get the whole picture. Each area has its own vibe, with its own enemies and its own puzzles or gimmick, and they can link to other areas through side quests or secrets. When you combine this structure with the progression and economy, and look, I can't lie, this game's pacing is something else. It's very addicting. I wanted to keep exploring, and every time I was going to put it down, I turned around and said, well, let's see what the next world is all about, and then well, let's see just one more area. None of these areas are overly long. They kind of breeze by in 15 to 30 minutes, even when pressing X on every wall to find hidden rooms. And because of how loot is doled out and shops and smithies are spaced out, there's always something to look forward to and something you want to try out. It's not perfect, especially with how those smithies and shops can end up later on requiring a lot of backtracking, but on average, it's really good. The balance of your equipment and stats plays a really important role, with you finding items that completely transform your options and lead to small intricacies. From completing Ariel's side quest, I obtained a ring which gave me the spell Explosion. When I combined this ring with a previous drop, the Crown of Resistance, which greatly increased my MP and overall magic abilities, this spell, at only 30 mana per cast, allowed me to integrate it into my regular strategy, alternating a fireball with a melee slash, but it also meant I had to keep an eye on my ring's durability. This system had me maximizing my equipment for strength, which gives you HP, before healing up to the maximum potential value of health points, and then using that HP to repair all of my equipment, and then setting out on the next level. This process is slow, as you check stats, min-max your repairs and equipment, all before heading out. But I never felt like I needed to do this. 
I more wanted to, because it was fun. Now please, O oh Lord, do not confuse the praise I'm giving with the game being perfect. The atmosphere I mentioned stays throughout the game, but it changes from an ominous hostile space into a still kind of spooky and unsettling one, but more of what I like to call virtual PS1 tourism. Something that you can see in other games like LSD Dream Emulator. While there is still gameplay and strategy, a lot of Shadow Tower is walking around areas, finding rooms and items, encountering events like side quests, and combat kind of quickly becomes a very simple dance with minimal risks, punctuated by specific encounters and rooms with a more puzzle-like configuration. For me, this was enjoyable almost all the way through and we'll talk more about the exceptions later. But for many people, this whiplash from dark foreboding and difficult into a mostly leisurely stroll through wilder and wilder fantasy environments could be an unwelcome change, and overall a not very interesting use of their time. I have the luxury of locking the game at 20 FPS, silky smooth, and using save states to circumvent loading. And while I did exercise restraint in their use, if I suspected I would get ganked or encounter new enemies, I would use them. Without these, I can see how the experience would be impacted and much of that pacing would be ruined. These quality of life improvements we can apply today help the game, but from a critical point of view, it's easy to imagine how much those deaths would accumulate into a lot of wasted time. I personally ended up using save states more and more as the risks grew while I advanced through the game, because I get the gist of it. I know where the save is and how painful that death would have been, but I don't personally need it. And I also want to finish this video someday and keep my video production calendar. Speaking of which, remember to subscribe so you don't miss those next videos. I would greatly appreciate that. It also has that From Software staple of very strange side objectives that aren't explained. Somewhere between a secret and a puzzle. Within the mines in the Earth region, you can obtain a crystal, and in the false pit caves, you can find a tower with flame. In your inventory, the crystal's description reads, Earth World Candle Fuel, which is also a fantastic name for a Midwest emo band. But that's your clue to insert it into the tower and watch as the flames turn blue. What does this do, you ask? Well, in this moment, you don't know. And as a person who has finished the game, I still don't know. And although this is something that's present in many of From Software's other games, this sort of interaction is more special than I thought. First, there's a puzzle to solve, and you might think that solving it is beneficial. But since nothing is explained, maybe it isn't. And maybe you won't find out until later that you shouldn't have done this. Maybe it will do nothing. But each one of these interactions that in other Souls games manifest in many different ways, including NPC questlines, plant a small seed of doubt and intrigue in your mind, and they keep you invested in what is to come, to see what the consequences of your actions actually are if you ever get to see them. This same area had me encountering my first big secrets, with this drop that I honestly wouldn't have taken without the use of save states, that leads to various rooms with great loot and tons of soul pods to level up. And this is another trend I love with this game. Secrets feel very rewarding. Finding zones will give you cool gear with great stats or useful spells, or will offer you level ups, or maybe three health potions and a mana potion. It's crazy. The game really isn't difficult, as I said before, and this all makes the game easier, sure, but it feels good, and that's what I want in the end. As I make my way through Earthworld, we reach an honestly difficult room filled with enemies and our first boss, Apollo, one of the Seven Knights. He's got a tentacle arm and paralyzes you all the time, but the room before the boss drops many anti-paralysis potions. This doesn't mean that it's fun to open the menu and scroll down to chug one each time you get inevitably paralyzed, but hey, it's 1998. At this point, we have six worlds to go, and things are only going to get crazier from here. Next up is Fire World, and yes, that is the name, and you guessed it, we get four areas filled with fire. 
This world continues the trend of self-contained regions with puzzles. You will flip bridges, turn off fire, shut off a lava current to take down a dragon. But this is also where the game starts throwing more enemies at you, and unavoidable damage as part of puzzles, which on top of your HP can cost you durability unless your equipment is resistant to the type of damage, in this case fire. It also gives us a very confusing final region, which is open air, with few landmarks. I mean, this game is one where it's incredibly easy to get turned around unless you're paying very close attention, and you probably need to have a good memory to boot. But in this final area, removing hallways, removing those walls actually makes it worse. For the Kingsfield series, one of the larger complaints early on was how samey each area was, making it confusing as you navigate the identical hallways. And Shadow Tower addresses this by having each of its many regions have unique tile sets that help them stand out. But there can still be confusion within those regions. Sure, this is better, and there are many technological advancements here compared to Kingsfield, and they also help. Caves have edges. Walls don't need to be straight. There are smatterings of rocks and other items. There's also more verticality, and all of these things help you identify where you are better. But sometimes, like this open area filled with bridges and darkness, that same feeling of frustration that you could get in Kingsfield of being very lost and wasting your time is still present. It's less than the endless loops of before, but still enough to be a problem quite often, and in case you hadn't noticed, no, you do not have access to a map. At the end of this area, you obtain a key that allows you to teleport and fight Ebony Knight, the Fire Lord. It's not a very difficult fight if you keep your distance, and then you teleport out, navigate back to the Shadow Tower between the two previous areas, and head down to the Impure Pool. Four more bosses to go. Next up is Water World, and as the game tells you, it's the only part of the tower with water. Except that the water here is all acid. <laughs> Yay. After some brief puzzle solving, this is the first chance the game gives you to go down a one-way path. Once you progress, you can't go back, eliminating your ability to backtrack to smithies or vendors from before. I was already not backtracking much because I don't want to spend half my life slowly walking in silence, but from here, you can head down and continue through Mel Gibson's wet dream. One of the larger problems for me with the game is that you need to equip items and armor to not die, both in combat and from environmental damage. But especially with the acid here in a water world, this acid constantly damages not only you, but the durability of your equipment. Which, again, is basically the most important thing in the game. This means that to fight at top strength, you want everything equipped, but navigating certain areas requires an immunity vaccine or unequipping everything. And this takes a while with how the menus work. This issue would be solved, if maybe still not very fun, by faster menus to equip and unequip, although I still don't think mechanics like these are fun in any game. The developers seem to agree, since this is something that does not exist in Shadow Tower Abyss. I do think it's cool though that the durability damage you take only applies to the things that come in contact with that damage. So in this next section filled with acid puddles, you only need to remove your boots to not take any durability damage from the acid. Once you're done with the absolutely horrible acid puddle caves that follow, you fight the boss, an ice mage and his Lapras army. It's again not a very difficult fight, although one where you could die, because the difficulty overall is more or less at its peak here and will start to go down the more you advance. This area, as far as I know, is also the only area for a while with a smithy available, and it's behind a very long walk down a hallway with acid. I never returned to this smithy, but I guess that if you needed it, it's here. But it is time consuming and annoying, and by just having another smithy easier to access, I'm sure that it would improve the game dramatically, since plenty of people will have wasted time in their original playthrough, heading back through all of these different hallways with acid just to repair their equipment. If there is one massive improvement presented later on in FromSoft's Souls-like catalog, is how much quality of life is implemented. 
The ability to repair weapons, the Estus Flask system, bonfires as something that you simply touch and you save and heal, and how much menus are streamlined. In combination, they eliminate a lot of time wasting and tedious backtracking that which can ruin the pace of something, and Shadow Tower, while having some excellent pacing on paper, can easily be ruined if you're not using save states and you take too much damage and force yourself to backtrack too often. Every area in this game feels different. It reminds me a lot of something like Super Mario or the famous Mario Galaxy effect, where each level feels unique and special despite sharing the same mechanics. And when you breeze through these levels, keeping everything interesting, it's great. But if you had to stop and head back very often or die too often, extending the playtime in a specific area, that wouldn't be as fun. The following area, Illusion, is all about being annoyed at curses, finding different chests and keys to power up, and big arenas where you fight tough enemies. Eventually, with little to no distractions, as you take down three mini-bosses and the final boss. It's a very combat-focused world in its entirety, and that is refreshing and in keeping with that good pacing that the game can have, with each area within this world having its own twist, but mostly centered on that combat, be it corridors with enemies at the end, mob fights, or one-on-one -on -one duels. The next boss here is Disguise, which is kind of a pushover. At this point in the game, my only worry was durability and not breaking weapons, but I had around 7 MP potions and plenty of rings. My mana was almost infinite, not sure why, but some combination of my equipment made me recover mana when hitting with spells. I also had 23 or 24 HP potions and plenty of money to buy more if I needed them, so it was almost impossible to die as long as I opened the menu and had an HP potion before dying. By the way, this doesn't make the game bad. This virtual tourism that ensues is fun. The puzzles, seeing the different enemy designs, it all stays engaging. Although I should mention, these enemies and locations will creep you out or seem interesting depending on your tolerance and ability to admire PS1 graphics. The next world on the list is Monster World, which wasn't what I expected. It really should be called Prehistoric Animal World, and it includes one area all about hidden walls and secrets and trying to kill every single enemy on the level. In this area, you get a katana, and you can use it to take down a giant headless ape. Huh, that, that feels familiar somehow. You can also take down a crab that gives you the Ring of Dark Souls. Also, uh, curious, I guess. But the puzzle here is to obtain a gem dropped by that big ape that you can use in the next area. There are only two areas in Monster World, and in that second one you will place the gem on a pedestal and make the otherwise invisible enemies appear. You have a smithy here, so I went wild with magic spells and my best weapons, since I could repair them very close by, and I shot down the boss, Necron, with a bow, because he doesn't move, and man, this was easy. He drops a very powerful ring with 46 durability, which translates to 46 casts before breaking. From here, you warp to Death World in the Dark Castle area. This is really a victory lap at this point, as you're probably heavily overstated, over-equipped, and stacked on potions. You also have holy spells included in that previous ring with 46 casts, and since the theme of this world is undead enemies and darkness, you can use that a lot to deal a lot of damage. There are some interesting puzzles here, but they require more backtracking and running between different areas than they did before, which is a nice escalation of the level design, but also a little tedious. At the end of all of this, the Hallow Mage is waiting, and once he is down, you have defeated all six of the major bosses. Defeating each boss lights up a stone on a final door. Once all six of those lights are on, you can head into the final world, Void, to take down Balron and then the King. Congratulations, you are the hero. There is some light, interesting lore throughout, and the concept of a tower with different themed levels, much like Dante's Divine Comedy and the Layers of Hell, leads to a game that, while it can have some serious pacing issues, and is definitely dated, and its core mechanics are this 
kind of clunky dungeon crawler, it remains entertaining and more straightforward than its sister in Kingsfield. It's a solitary adventure, and certain decisions, such as the lack of music, feel very appropriate at the start, but slowly, just as pacing can wane, so does that atmosphere. But it's very memorable, thanks to its structure, and its core mechanics and progression remain strong in what it wants to do throughout, despite how easy the game can be. But From Software wasn't finished with this idea yet, and decided to revisit Shadow Tower on the PS2 in 2003. This was never localized, but this era is a tremendously interesting one for From Software, where they also worked on Echo Knight Beyond, Otogi, Myth of Demons, and Kuon. They were definitely excited to work on the PS2 hardware, and that makes sense as a studio famously quoting being held back in its design ambitions by the hardware of the PS1. So what exactly is Shadow Tower Abyss, and how well does it move forward what Shadow Tower started? Is it significantly different from Kingsfield? Well oh boy, let's begin. Shadow Tower Abyss is wild. It is a continuation of many of the ideas from the original, but with fundamental changes that make it lean harder into what the original did well, differentiating it further from its Kingsfield counterpart. The most apparent new element has to do with its modern setting. You now use guns, and you have two weapons equipped, allowing you to swap on the fly between any two weapons, but it's clearly designed so that you carry a melee weapon and a gun, and are able to switch from ranged to melee with a button press. Many clickbait videos and articles sell this game as From Software going crazy and making Dark Souls with guns. I don't know if this comes from creators lacking more knowledge of other games, although I will be honest, the only video I remember watching on Shadow Tower Abyss is Iron Pineapple's video from a while back, and I didn't remember almost anything about it when entering it now. But this game is not really that much of a Dark Souls with guns, it's more of a Kingsfield with Resident Evil. I'm being precise here when mentioning Resident Evil, because this isn't all that much of a survival horror game. It's more action skewed and a little hokey monster fiction fun at times, but it's a game where resource management is kicked up to 11, while preserving the core ideas of Shadow Tower. Namely, there is a tower in Shadow, you can't level up except with soul pod consumables, but each enemy you defeat makes you stronger. Your health is still your main economy, allowing you to repair your weapons and armor, which is still your main concern. Levels continue to be very distinct, with their own gimmicks and mechanics, all inside their little bubble. Secrets are still very heavily rewarded, and difficulty is still not very high. But just about everything is better. Guns are balanced very intelligently, because durability is less of a concern for them, but ammo is. Kunes, the currency, is now much more present and also more valuable and useful. You can trade it to buy items a lot more than you could before, but you probably won't need to. You'll spend your kunes to buy health potions, both for survival and for repairs, but you will also spend them to buy ammo this time around. Your general progression is still one of becoming very powerful towards the end of the game, and it retains the same magic system that uses rings, but you only have one equipped. Combat, while still not great, is so much better from the perspective of mechanics, and still very satisfying even by today's standards, thanks to the feedback and animations on enemies being taken to a whole new, modern level. If you choose control type 3 or 4, you can use the right analog stick for looking up and down, as well as for strafing. It's not FPS controls and can still be wonky, but it frees up buttons. For melee attacks, your shoulder buttons correspond to different attacks. L2 is a forward piercing stab, R2 is a vertical slash, and L1 and R1 are horizontal slashes. When using firearms, L1 will holster the weapon and R1 will shoot it. Magic is now solely dedicated to the square button, while triangle swaps your weapons from the two you have equipped. 
Circle interacts and X opens the menu. Start is still pause, but select is now a quick item slot. Because of these changes and more, combat feels more strategic and also faster as a result. Each of these things I've mentioned makes sense and is fully utilized to its maximum potential throughout the playthrough. The game in general is also shorter, even though this video won't reflect that too well in the length of this section, but it's mainly shorter because of the better pacing, level design, and distribution, which leads to less meaningless backtracking. I think there's also a little less overall, but if you just looked at the runtime of footage, my playthrough of Shadow Tower 1 was almost twice as long as Abyss. And I don't think that reflects the difference in quantity in those games. It's more how much has been streamlined and eased up in Abyss. I did continue to use save states for Shadow Tower Abyss, but I'll be honest, I forgot half the time, and when I did die, I had to reload anyways. Having said that, let's walk through the game. Starting off in a forest, something has gone awry. There's dead soldiers strewn all across, and all you have is your trusty 1911 and your punches and kicks. Because of this, you immediately get introduced to two of the biggest changes, guns and limb damage. Shooting in the game feels good and immersive somehow. The idea of not having a crosshair and just aiming around the center of the screen, which is something I had gotten used to from my playthrough of Shadow Tower. But guns are also very well balanced by making you very slow when you have them out. You not only move slow, but turn and aim slowly. And this is where that holster button comes in. Once you start shooting, you'll notice that hitting enemies in different limbs will cause different reactions and different damage. A headshot can blow an enemy away in one shot, while it might take four or five to the body. Shooting their arms or legs will have them go flying, affecting their mobility and changing their attack patterns and behavior. This will also apply to your melee weapons, making you think about which of the different strikes to use on which enemies to cripple them. This means the technology of the PS2 has not been used only to increase the visual fidelity of the game, which can look stunning at times, but it's also leveraged in gameplay with how each of these enemies' detailed models have these hitboxes for this mechanic, and I love it. Obviously, this isn't one of the best looking games on the system. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 released in 2001, so almost two years later, and this game is struggling to keep 30 FPS, and I wouldn't really call this a technical achievement, but it doesn't mean the game looks bad, and most important to me, how it uses what's available to it to achieve its goals. Also, like my god, Metal Gear Solid 2 was technically impressive as heck, wasn't it? Shadow Tower can boast one thing from modern games that people talk about very often now, it doesn't have any loading screens. The original one also didn't, but really it did. When you cross doors, it fades to black for a while. But Shadow Tower Abyss is a truly seamless experience. There are no loading screens unless you die, and it adds to the feeling of exploring this tower in one continuous, exhausting climb to the heavens that all takes place in a single day. It continues with the legacy of the first Shadow Tower in keeping music to a minimum, but will include short stingers for new areas or specific moments. But it now adds much more audio. Gone are the cheesy but sometimes unsettling distorted sound bites that identified each enemy, and welcome are howling winds and echoey caverns, the pitter-patter of enemy movement, with satisfying hit sounds for both melee and guns, and an attention to small details like the sound of being underwater or walking over branches. While there's no music, the game is almost never silent, and it uses that because when there is silence, it's deeply unsettling. The forest hits you up front with all of this. As you explore it, take down enemies, and eventually fall into the boat that will ferry you to the tower. As you explore it, you get to understand the new interpretations of the previous systems. Blue orbs save the game. Green orbs are shops. Purple orbs repair equipment. And red orbs allow you to trade items or HP, but it's directly HP, not potions. Here you'll also meet Ariel again. Aside from the side quest I mentioned from the beginning of Shadow Tower, she shows up along with the Weasel Man, or the Rodent, or whatever, as the two main NPCs that accompany you throughout your adventure in the original. 
She can be found in hidden rooms and can offer you additional benefits in that game, and she was really the most standout character. So she's back again, and she will be the one accompanying you all the way to the end of Shadow Tower Abyss. In this game, she gives you the key to the elevator room, where your adventure proper will begin. The structure of Shadow Tower Abyss is that you have to take certain elevators up to continue ascending the tower, but you need to find the keys in the levels that are on each of the floors. However, the levels within each floor are not connected anymore and are just their own levels. The first one that you are meant to tackle is the insect area, which is a large nest of crickets and termites that are battling each other. And this is where you first notice a major departure from the original. The themes for these areas are all kind of strange and don't really follow the fantasy archetypes from before and how they populate the areas. Instead, the enemies are contextualized to each wacky idea for each area. There are way less enemy types than in Shadow Tower 1, but they're all noticeably more advanced in their AI patterns and overall quality, including that contextualization. As you explore this area, you will end up encountering the Termite Queen, which will be your major objective. You'll explore the halls and fight bugs, and this area overall is very striking and memorable, but not very good. Flying enemies can be a pain, and the long-range venom-spitting termites can be way too strong with a lot of aggressive tracking, especially for what is intended to be the first area in the game. It can also be very maze-like, a problem that remains from older iterations of these games that is sometimes later on remedied, and sometimes even worse than before. This area in particular is not the worst, but it isn't good. But with the game being fresh, this didn't bother me. Instead of dissecting bugs, I enjoyed dissecting the design decisions and improvements made elsewhere. The UI is much more elegant than what we had before, and hides some important changes. You now have your HP bar and your mana bar at the top left, and they are bars now and not just a number. But above your HP bar is your power bar. When you have a gun, it displays your ammo, and when you have melee, it displays the number of consecutive hits that you have before needing to recover. Gone are the days of waiting for the power bar to fill up in order to attack. Now, all your attacks always have the same damage, which from a balancing perspective must have had some very meaningful implications. Before, you could swing at half power and do half damage, but now the numbers end up being more rounded and easier to predict, and you have the ability to do fast combos depending on how many attacks you have available. This means that when calculating HP numbers, they can be set at more logical breakpoints, looking for a specific number of hits that would feel good to take down enemies. This has a profound impact on the combat pacing and how you approach it. You have also lost the damage numbers popping up when attacking that you had in the original, but now you don't need them. Since unless it's a special enemy or boss, enemies will rarely take more than 4 or 5 hits, and those are the tankier ones. 2 or 3 hits is the average for most enemies, and this feels, and I hate myself for saying this, a lot more like Dark Souls. You'll choose a weapon with a good balance between its damage and its number of hits, so that you can take enemies out within one combo, constantly switching to whatever weapon or hit type an enemy is weak to in order to optimize this combat loop. And man, it feels so much better than before. Changing those weapons and equipment around is now way faster and easier, thanks to the new menu. At first, it felt very awkward to navigate my inventory like this, but it makes a lot of sense. You use left and right to choose what slot you have selected, even though visually you're moving up and down the representation of your body. This is all to eliminate one button press, the one you would use to select that slot. Instead, you can quickly switch between each slot with left and right and swap what's equipped in that slot using up and down. It might not be intuitive, but it is elegant. You also have a small representation of yourself in the bottom right corner, showing you what you have equipped, and more importantly, each part of this will turn red when the durability of that item is close to zero. 
No longer do you have to be paranoid and open up your equipment menu after every attack to see how close you are to breaking. I enjoyed all of these changes as I made my way through the termites, but my first impressions weren't very good so far when it came to levels, despite how good it felt to play the game and all of the changes it presented. As I continued, this didn't really improve. The violent poison area is, well, yeah, you guessed it, it's, it's about poison. And I apologize in advance, because here comes a massive rant about poison swamps in video games, but I promise it makes sense and it'll be the most logical reasoning you've ever heard as to why they need to be reworked or not exist. The poison area in this game has you constantly poisoned, but gone is the durability damage that you would suffer in Shadow Tower 1. This damage is also very manageable, it barely matters. It doesn't do much damage and goes away fairly quickly as you complete the objective of the area, which is to place purification crystals at all of the fountains in the area in order to rid it of poison. So here's the question, if it doesn't really impact the game, what is the point of it? So let's talk about this not only in the context of this game, but also in the context of Dark Souls and many other games. From a design perspective, inflicting the player with a negative status effect is normally done as a punishment for poor play. The price to pay is normally consumables or some sort of time loss to mitigate. Poison or other lingering status effects are chosen instead of others to instill panic in the player, where they now have decisions to make. Generally, in game design, it's good to force the players into situations that require decisions instead of a simple action-reaction. When you're poisoned, there's multiple things you can do. You can wait it out and mitigate the health loss by holding on until the next healing area, for example. You also have to balance your consumables and how many you have can factor into this decision. You can also be poisoned at a time when it's inconvenient to remove that poison if the act of removing it might cause you to stop and stand still or force an animation. That is the case with Dark Souls, but it's not the case here. This all means that in concept, it's all good. But in FromSoft's games, it isn't a punishment, it's very often a requirement. In that circumstance, all it becomes is an annoyance, a constant downtick of your HP bar in the corner. In Dark Souls, it's often simply something you have to ignore, you speedrun through it or accumulate consumables in order to traverse it, no different than requiring a key. The exception is when you give players the option to obtain equipment to negate it, but that isn't the case here, nor is it in many instances of the Soul series. Although in Shadow Tower Abyss you can obtain certain gear that will do this but for other status effects later on in the game. You could then argue that Poison is simply a psychological trick to generate a feeling of urgency and panic in the player, a timer of sorts. But if the trick is psychological, it relies entirely on other factors that can't be calculated, mainly how the player will feel about it instead of how the player can respond to it. I wasn't affected by this poison psychologically, nor did it impact my gameplay, so it was useless. It's like adding a sandy area in a game which slows down your movement. Sure, it makes sense and might add to the feeling of immersion, but honestly, only if it's briefly and to show you that they acknowledge the idea. If after that, you don't incorporate the slower sand into traversal or combat and it's just there and all it does is slow you down moving from A to B, why have it? All this to say, poison is not a bad mechanic as a status effect but it's often used badly. It needs to be balanced very well to be engaging, and this poison area would be much better if instead it did something like blinding you, limiting your vision, which could make you more paranoid about ambushes, for example. That also doesn't sound fun in this game in particular, but if you designed the area around that, it would be a lot cooler and more fun than what we have here. Anyways, this is the poison area. It teaches you to look up at humans that have been strung up and you can shoot them down to loot them. You can fight some evil poison worms that can divide into smaller worms and you also get a stone here, which you'll use in the next area, the chalk stone area. This one features little weird enemies that remind me of Half-Life's Vortigons and some of them are very sad and afraid of whoever is the boss. This is the first area where you have a wealth of secrets throughout, offering strong weapons and armor as well as straight up combat arenas that lock down until you've cleared them. 
They introduce this idea of secrets by forcing you to knock down a wall to even enter this area, teaching you that certain walls can be broken. And of course, you'll still find secret walls to open by spamming interact everywhere. The boss of this area is a chimera, after which you obtain the key to the elevator. While this area has great atmosphere, especially thanks to the friendly enemies contemplating their existence, it also only has these enemies and the boss, meaning that it kind of dragged on due to the lack of enemy variety. You head to the elevator, you talk to Ariel, and head up. The next area is Scouring Rush, which is honestly a very sci-fi area and the worst one when it comes to being maze-like. Upon entering it, I got strong Metroid Prime vibes, which is a game released a whole year earlier than Shadow Tower Abyss. Man, Metroid Prime really was technically and design-wise ahead of its time, <laughs> guys, am I right? And it makes sense that I was reminded of it, since Shadow Tower Abyss is one step closer to an FPS than before, but it's still mainly an exploration puzzle game, much like Metroid. This area focuses on giant venom plants that block off different areas throughout a very vertical, tower-like structure. If it were darker, I would even call it a shadow tower. This area is notable mechanically for two things. First is how it focuses even more on targeting specific limbs in its combat. The enemies here are a combination of the previous floor's enemies with a couple original ones. They are all controlled by the water plants, which are the same ones, I think, than what you saw in Earth Realm of the original Shadow Tower. You can focus down the plants and the other enemies will just stand there afterwards, free stat increases. But when you do have to fight them head on, or even in their passive states, they have a mutation on a specific part of their body which you can target, and if you chop it off, they will instantly die. Chop anything else off and that will actually regenerate. The other mechanic that I encountered here is encumbrance. Among the tons of loot to find here, including a damn AR-15, which is just hilarious but awesome and also very important later, I ended up going over the weight limit, and I was confused as to why. Shadow Tower Abyss works in this system much better than I thought. Considering that your arsenal and its durability is so crucial, the next logical step was to limit your total inventory, which is what it does. Everything you're carrying contributes to your weight limit instead of only what you have equipped, as in the original. This means you can't amass an infinite amount of weapons and armor to keep going on forever. Instead, you're incentivized to store it at the shop or sell things. This adds another layer of decision making and also has the side effect of keeping your inventory a bit tidier. This never felt excessively limiting or frustrating as I initially thought it would be. It's all quite well balanced. I simply had to stop and think, meaningfully, what I wanted to carry right now and plan ahead. In this same area, sometime after taking down the joke of a boss, or thematic boss if you prefer, at the base of the giant plant, you can later obtain a massive dual-handed blade that has very high damage, but also a very high weight. Do you want to keep this on you despite its low durability and high weight in case you need it? Or do you want to store it, hoping that you won't need it now and you can use it at a future boss or tough encounter? I like this, the same as I like many things, only when well balanced. And I think that is more or less the case this time around. It's more well done than it is frustrating towards the end game. Within this area, you also encounter your first side quest or side story. There's a shady looking guy that is still alive in here, and he asks you for five cunes that he needs for something important to him, but he won't say. You can ignore him, you can kill him, or you can give him the cunes. I chose the last option, and in exchange, he gives you a key to a room that's completely empty except for a trap. Once you finish this area, you can enter directly from it into the waterfall area, where he will be waiting, and he will mock you. He says he will give you a map to the area if you don't kill him, but as you walk forward, he will drop you into the water below. Welcome to the water level. The water here slows you down, and there are currents that drag you to whirlpools of death. This level is visually interesting and varied, making it one of the most pleasant ones. It's free from maze-like structures and greatly reduces the potential to get lost. 
You will constantly be going from navigating the caves, the caves but underwater, and also some portions above, which are kind of prehistoric land since the enemies here are all dinosaurs. That keeps the whole level feeling quite brisk, and I love that feeling. That is when Shadow Tower feels the best. A small detail I loved was obtaining the life jacket, which, if you equipped it, allows you to move at normal speed underwater. From what I understand, this entire level is optional, but it encompasses most of what makes Shadow Tower as a franchise interesting. A discreet level with an interesting gimmick that's fun to explore, fight in, collect loot, and quickly move on to the next. And from here, that trend continues almost to the end of the game. All killer, no filler. Next up is the cliffs area, which, as you might imagine, is composed of cliffs. Flying enemies are all you'll fight, and here guns and magic take center stage, and will continue to be important again all the way to the end. I don't think that's a coincidence, by the way, that a better spread of the expected weapon usage and which ones are the priority, along with a shift in level design, suddenly improves the overall quality. As you navigate the cliffs, you'll carefully aim headshots at the enemy harpies until you defeat the Queen Harpy, which had been collecting some loot in her nest, including the elevator key. From here, you'll make your way back through a shortcut to the elevator room and head on up to the Red Desert. This area's gimmick is a shrieking howl that constantly damages you, along with having your magic sealed. Shadow Tower, the original one, did this as well towards the later levels, and just like there, there are both items to mitigate it as well as equipment that will protect you from these seals. That shrieking howl is the most important part of the story of Shadow Tower, which I haven't spoken before about, but I will now. This tower seems to be, much like the one in Shadow Tower 1, a tower that people want to ascend to obtain godhood in. More specifically, in this tower, they seek the spear, and using the spear, they will be able to attain that godhood. As per usual, a lot of the story is very vague, and there are things here that kind of connect to other stuff. Necron was a boss in Shadow Tower 1, but he's also an important part of Kingsfield 2, if I remember correctly. So, you know, there's a lot of that From Software narrative going on, and I'm not the biggest narrative guy. I don't want to start analyzing every little detail and item description to understand what is really happening here, but you get the gist of it. Tower gives power, people go to tower. And in this case, a spear gives big power. After you dash through the whole level, you find the spear. That spear that everyone wants. On your way to the spear, you'll also see the NPC that tricked you from before and threw you in the water. And in case you haven't put two and two together, this NPC I'm pretty sure is Patches, the infamous merchant that shows up in most FromSoft games. Once you touch the spear, it breaks, and a boss fight ensues. After this, you're free to either head back or explore the area for loot. This is a pretty small and straightforward area, but it does allow you to explore once you no longer have that pressure from the constant damage of the spear shrieking, I guess. If I had known how close I was to the end of the game, and how much loot would start to outpace itself, I probably wouldn't have bothered looting the whole area, but I did nonetheless. The difficulty curve in Abyss is very similar to the original, where there's a few tough peaks, but mostly it's just difficult at the start until you get your bearings and start getting some good equipment. After that, you'll be swimming in weapons, armor, magic, and cunes to buy ammo or potions. One more elevator ride will take you to the final levels of the game, including my favorite, and more optional ones. Before that though, if you've made it here in the video, remember to leave a like or subscribe. I've heard that doing so mid-video is a super bump in the algorithm. I've had a blast making this video, and I would like to do more of them more often, and for my dreams of supporting myself while doing what I love to come true, all you have to do to help is like and subscribe. And you get more content in the process by doing that, so it's a win-win for everyone. While we're at it, let me know some other retro games from the era that you think deserve an in-depth look like these games do down in the comments. The next two areas are the largely optional ones, being the dense fog area and the moving platform area. And you can guess what they're all about from the names once again. 
The gimmick in the dense fog area is that all the enemies fly and are invisible once they start attacking. Very fun. This is why I continued with guns, basically until the end of the game from here. The goal of the level is to find four key pieces throughout it, while looting everything and all of that, and taking them back to the start so you can open a door. You also have to navigate some moving platforms in preparation for the next area, which is neat in a sense, and it does prepare you a little. The boss of this level is this Nightmare Before Halloween reject and four very tough enemies of the normal variety that you've been seeing throughout the level. And the nature of this fight is one where you will almost certainly take damage and need to use potions to heal through it. But it's not difficult. No fight in the game really is due to how the combat system works. Once this is done, you can access the hidden moving platform area, a sandy cave with moving platforms that you can use to move through hallways, stopping at rooms to loot. You can also reverse the platforms to navigate back again. This area uses multiple types of these flying robot looking fellows that use magic and saw blades and they hit very hard. You will have to use magic and guns to shoot them down while on the platforms and if you ever miss your stop and crash into a wall or fall off, you're donezo. This is the only area where after a couple of deaths I used save states without hesitation and very often. I can't imagine playing through this area on original hardware and losing large amounts of progress each time. Towards the final hallway, you don't have any rooms on these moving platforms, but you can find a sword and two chests, each containing a ring. One with holy magic and one with dark magic, and these are, as far as I know, the two strongest spells in the game. The final reward behind it all is the gold mask, which has amazing stats as well as very fast MP regeneration. Once you finish all this and head back to the elevator room, Ariel will be waiting and will ask you if you can give her the peace of death. If you take her down, which is what I chose to do, she will drop a ring which boosts all your stats dramatically, but doesn't have any spell attached to it, so you can't use magic. Which, if locked behind clearing that moving platform area, is really smart, since that optional area offers you great rewards for those interested in magic. Once you leave, you get access to a different reward for people who don't want to use it. By this point, you are supremely overpowered and have options for anything you might want to do. And it's just a ride of a power trip to the end. The final area is Illusion, but there aren't many illusions here, and instead it's like a dark Castlevania-esque castle. So, the castle of Illusion. The final gimmick is the need to explore different wings of the castle and defeat mini-bosses to free some of the souls of the girls here. These will also drop keys. Placing the keys correctly in the central room will open paths with teleporters, and to decipher the next path, you simply have to never remove a key that's already worked to move forward. You make your way through the castle, fighting each of the bosses, and your overpowered arsenal of guns, hard-hitting endgame weapons, and black lightning magic, and acid, and fire, and holy, until you defeat all five and open the door to the boss. I think it's clever how defeating each of these five mini-bosses lights up a little light at the door, much like the final boss door in the original Shadow Tower. The boss here goes down in no time at all, he really just falls over, and gives you the last elevator key. This level is fantastic. It's paced well between actually intense duels with enemies, exploration, secret hunting, and puzzle solving. It's short, it uses the colors on windows to avoid making each hallway identical and having you get lost, has plenty of secrets, it's just very good even if some of the challenge is gone from the fact that you are, you know, very overpowered. With the final elevator key, you head up to the top and you will talk to the brain heart of the tower. I'm not sure if it's meant to be a brain or a heart, but I don't know. And here, you fight Ariel's ghost. I think this would be Ariel if you don't kill her before, but I'm not sure and I didn't go back to test it. This fight is just as easy as you might imagine since you already took down Ariel, and after it, the credits roll. Shadow Tower Abyss is wildly different from Dark Souls and Kingsfield, in a good way. It focuses on different aspects while having that FromSoft DNA. The way that certain ideas from the original are revisited fleshed out and tuned further is something that the studio loves to do, and adding gunplay to the mix was really a stroke of genius in both 
differentiating it further and adding something that works perfectly with the more survival elements of the game and resource management. It really can't be overstated how fresh and interesting the basic formula of both games is. This huge tower divided into impossible levels that don't make sense, but you can roll with due to the context. Deserts, dinosaur water levels, vampire castles, or science fiction dungeons, they all fit and lead to a wildly creative game that keeps you guessing on what it's going to do next in bite-sized chunks that are always enjoyable to explore. If not always really fun or the best design, but you know that they won't take too long and you'll be onto the next one quickly enough. The idea of enemies that don't respawn and simply level you up on kill, along with the absurd power progression, is satisfying as a more casual outing compared to what Kingsfield 4 and Dark Souls would become. And it's convinced me, outright, that this is a franchise I would love to see return. Much like the natural conclusion for the Kingsfield branch of From Software was its evolution into Dark Souls and now Elden Ring, I think the natural conclusion for Shadow Tower is to become a full-fledged first-person shooter, a slow one, a survival-oriented one, like a Resident Evil Village, for example. And if done today, following many of these core elements, I think it could be a very special game that would appeal to a lot of people. It wouldn't reach the heights of what Dark Souls and Elden Ring have achieved, but it could hold a special place in many people's hearts. If we just compare it to something like Resident Evil 4, that game is beloved to this day and replayed by many over and over again, and I could see myself having a similar relationship to a 2024 edition of Shadow Tower. These aren't fantastic games, but they are both supremely interesting games in how they approach many ideas, even when removed from their souls-like lineage, and perhaps even more so in where they differ the most. I don't think Shadow Tower is really worth digging back through to play, but Abyss is a heck of a ride. I think that a lot of the success of Dark Souls and its offspring are due to the commitment of From Software from so long ago within Kingsfield to continue iterating on a very particular vision that only grew stronger and more defined over time. Many of the core concepts that people found so punishing in Dark Souls 1 were simply holdovers from a time gone by in games, but the team that made it believed that modernizing those previous ideas didn't mean eliminating those punishing runbacks or the hostile atmosphere. It simply meant bringing them into a new era and streamlining some elements. These games aren't obtuse because a lack of technology, script writing, or localization mistakes. It's a design decision that they stuck with as the industry went in a different direction. And as happens in many other industries, when they bring back something old, or when a specific studio or artist or designer never moves from what they do, as trends change, they're always circular, and they'll be in vogue all over again, and the spotlight will fall on you. In the case of From Software, once the spotlight hit with Dark Souls, it hasn't gone away, because it turns out that good video games with good design never go out of fashion. Shadow Tower represents an era of experimentation, wild experimentation within the studio's philosophy, not only in this game, but in the many others that they developed. But it feels as fresh today as Dark Souls felt in 2011. Sure, these games are not as good as Dark Souls, but they are fresh, and a modern iteration of them would carry that onwards, no question. Thank you for watching. This was a blast to do, and if you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, the whole shebang. I really want to do more of these, so those recommendations I asked for before are appreciated. I'm committed to tallying them all up on an Excel sheet and using that to decide future videos. I'm interested in doing a full siphon filter retrospective or maybe exploring more FromSoft titles like Echo Knight and Echo Knight Beyond but I really want to do these deep dives for games that haven't gotten this treatment yet whenever I can, which is why I want those recommendations. If you want to support this channel, 
you already did so by watching this video. More in-depth analyses of both retro games and new releases are coming fast and furious, as well as all my other usual content. I've been Mug Thief, and thank you so much for watching, and I will see you again very soon.